And notice verse 24. And that ye put on the new man. Now I want you to notice this. When we're saved, I've already told you, the old man don't go away. It's still there. That's the old sinful person. The old sinful nature is still there. We have to willingly take him off. And we have to willingly and consciously put something else on. Right here he tells us to put on the new man. Look what it says. Which after God is created in righteousness. What does the word righteousness mean? What is acceptable to God and true holiness. So we're taking off our old mind. We're putting on our new mind. And what mind is that? It is righteous, it is acceptable to God, it knows what is acceptable to God, and notice what it says, and true holiness. The word holiness means what is separated from sin, totally separated from sin. The Bible tells us to have the mind of Christ. There's a good, another way to put it. We take off our thinking, we realize that we don't have the answers, and we put on what? What God says. And we say, I'm going to follow what God says. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Your own understanding, folks, is the old man that you're supposed to take off. Now look what it says in verse 25. Wherefore, because of this, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another, speaking of the church. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What in the world does that mean? Be angry and sin not. Did the Bible just tell me to be angry? It did. But it said be angry and sin not. What are we supposed to be angry about? Remember the context of what he's talking about. He's talking about getting rid of the sin nature. Trying to put on the God's nature. We need to do what God does to sin. You know how God views sin? These people that talk about uh, God's love, and by the way, the Bible does say God is love, but the Bible also says God hates things. Amen? Let me give you a verse of Scripture in the book of Romans, same chapter, chapter 12 that we were just in. The Bible says, Let love be without hypocrisy, Abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. We are to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And folks, that starts in our own life. We are to hate the sin in our life. God tells you, get angry at the sin in your life. Notice what is connected with. Look at that. Be angry and what is it directly connected with? Sin not. If we're not angry at the sin in our life, what are we going to do with sin in our life? Folks, again, this is elementary stuff here. We like sin. Sin appeals to us. You say, preacher, who are you talking to? Every one of us. Sin is all about that instant gratification. It's serving self. Why, when you were little, when your mom and dad said, did you do that? Why did you go? Because it was getting you out of trouble. Instant gratification. Is that sin? Yeah. But it comes so natural, doesn't it? God said, get angry. Be angry. Abhor that which is evil. Now, why should the sin in our life make us angry? Because it keeps us from fulfilling the very purpose that God has for us. How many of us on Sunday morning, we were talking about this yesterday. Isn't it funny? We get up, most of us, get up and we have a job that we have to be at at 8 o'clock in the morning. Right? Six, seven days a week, something. Church doesn't start, Sunday school starts at 10 o'clock. Why is it? It seems like it's something strange about Sunday morning. 
your body really, really, really wants to sleep more on Sunday morning. Because we think 10 o'clock is early. We had to be at the job at 8 o'clock. I'm doing a little math here. 8, 9, 10. That's Sunday school. 11 is the message. Why is it so hard to get to church on Sunday? It's not that it's too early in the morning. What is it? It's our old sin nature. It's our old sin nature. Our sin gets in the way of our service for God. That's why he says, Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Look at verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give the devil an opportunity. You know what Eve did wrong in the Garden of Eden? She gave the devil an opportunity. Instead of hating that tree that God told her to stay away from, she started looking at it. She started thinking about it. That tree looks good. That fruit looks good. Those tomatoes look good on that tree, Brother John. They were pre-salted tomatoes. I know it's in the Bible somewhere. I'm joking. Y'all don't look that up. But Eve started looking at it, thinking, that's good. Right here the Bible says, don't give place to the devil. In the book of Proverbs, he puts it this way, put blinders on. You look straight ahead. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. The straight would be God's path for you. Folks, when God says it, shouldn't that be enough? Now I asked y'all just a minute ago, how many of you in here knew of one thing that God wanted you to do, wanted you to do better, whatever it was, and, and I saw a lot of heads doing like this. Why haven't you done it already then? You're giving place to the devil. You're thinking about it. When God says it, do it. Amen? Do it. Remember what the psalmist said last week? I don't know if you can remember back that far. But the psalmist said, because your word is the meditation of my heart day and night, he said, I hate every false path. Y'all remember that? Because all he was allowing himself to think about was God's way. God's way. When we stay focused on what our job is, on what God has for us to do, we will hate those false ways because we will recognize them as getting in our way. Those are stumbling blocks to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Let's be honest. Most of us in here have a little bit of age. That's a nice way of saying it. How many of us can look back on our lives and see a time that we allowed ourselves on our path of doing what God wanted us to do. We, we allowed ourselves to stumble and fall off that path that God wanted us to be on, and we stayed off of it for quite a while. How many of us can guess what started that? One little stumbling block started that whole backslid, backsliding. Right here the Bible says, don't even give place to the devil. Don't even allow him to tempt you. Just say no. What did Jesus say to Peter? Y'all remember? Get behind me, Satan. Y'all remember what that was all about? Jesus was trying to teach that he had to die. And Peter said, no, you're not going to die. Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You say, why was that a temptation? Don't you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, is there any way? If there's any way, let this cut pass. If there's any other way. That was a real temptation to Jesus in the flesh. And Jesus didn't even allow Himself to look at it. Get behind me. Same way in the Garden. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Look at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that or in order that he may have to give to him that needeth. And by the way, so that same person will see God in you. Notice what it says, work that which is good. Instead of sitting there thinking about the false way, do what is right. Verse 29. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication. Does everybody see? Go back to verse 28. Remember I said there's two ways of being a witness. One is the way you live. The other is the way you talk. 
verse 28 is the way you live. He said, don't steal no more, but labor doing what is right. Everybody see that? That's being the right example, doing the right thing. Why is it so important that I go to church? I, I used to hear things like this. Well, it's a nice business meeting. I'm not going to go to that. Well, I don't get much out of that class. I don't, I don't care for the preacher that's coming today, so I'm just going to stay home. Why is it important that you don't stay home? Let's even, let's even get off the subject of it doing anything for you. Is there another reason that you should come other than yourself? The example, not only to the people that don't go to church, but even the people that do come to church. Amen? Uh, one of the things that has always bothered me as a pastor, it's always bothered me. Uh, and I've noticed it, it happens almost every time. You'll get visitors coming. And those visitors are excited about coming. And they'll come Sunday morning, they'll come to Sunday school class, they'll even come back Sunday night and come on a Wednesday night. Until they see something. Until they see that not 10% of the members actually go to a class and come to all services even on Wednesday. And then you won't see those visitors back on the Wednesdays in the class. And that's always aggravated me. I thought, well, you see, you come to church for more than just yourself. Amen? Remember the two things I said? It does make you grow but it's also your job. You're being that witness. You're being that example. Let no corrupt... Now verse 29, it's how we speak. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace. Y'all remember this morning, what did it say? Let your speech always with grace, seasoned with salt. Y'all remember that this morning? Right here it says, no corrupt communication. The word corrupt there means something... Y'all already know what that is because we talked about our minds being corrupt. You don't want to feed the sin nature in other people. What do you want to feed? Look what it says. That which is good to the use of edifying. What does the word edifying mean? It means building up. And literally we are talking about building spiritually. So the things that you say should cause other people to grow spiritually. You know, I've heard this verse used as, well, you shouldn't ever say anything negative to people. Folks, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says that the rebuke from a friend is better than the kisses from an enemy. Amen? Sometimes there's a need to say something negative. Uh, if we are doing what is wrong, if the pastor is doing what is wrong, you know what I want you all to do? Please don't go and start talking behind my back about what I'm doing wrong. Come to me and talk to me about it. Amen? Right? So it's not talking about not anything negative. He's saying what you say needs to be for the betterment, for the spiritual betterment of those people. How, how often, let me convict you all for a minute, how often is your speech outside these doors for the spiritual benefit of the people around you? Sometimes we, children of God, have a bad habit of getting down on the level and I don't mean we're above anybody, but what I mean is we start acting like the unsaved world when we're around the unsaved. We need to remember we're supposed to be being a witness right then. Amen? And again, that starts with our immediate family and our extended family and our friends and our neighbors. He says, don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. We say, Brother Chris, what should I be... What should I say then? How many of y'all know what Facebook is? Some of y'all do. It's a new thing. It's social media. And what it is, everybody has a little place and they can all say things on the computer and you get to see what they say. Like, I'm feeling bad today or I'm mad at so-and-so today or I'm happy today or whatever it is. I've noticed there's some people, and some of y'all that have Facebook will laugh at this, there's some people that are always griping. Always. <laughs> if you see their picture and know that they're posting, they're always griping. It's going to be some kind of gripe. 
some of the, some of my friends, I had to defriend them because they were saying things that I didn't want to hear, and I didn't want my friends hearing. And I want I want to be clear, folks. I'm not a prude. Y'all know what a prude is. I'm not a prude. I understand things of the world. But we don't have to act like that. We don't have to be that way. And again, there's two reasons. But the one we're focusing on tonight is the example that we're being, the witness that we're being to the people around. I don't know if y'all realize what an impact that your life is on the people around you. And I'm talking about the people that don't go to church. I have talked to people before, and I know y'all have heard things like this. Well, I'm not going to go to church because everybody at that church is a hypocrite. Y'all heard things like that? And then they'll start naming some people. This is so-and-so, and this is what they do. I've heard them cussing like a sailor, and I've seen them doing this. And I... Yes, that's an excuse, okay? And they're going to have to answer. But guess what? Those are real things they're quoting. And they have been an example and a hindrance. The Bible says we need to be very careful not to be a stumbling block. Actually, it gets a little bit more graphic than that. Jesus said if you are a stumbling block, it would be better if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown in the ocean. That's how serious it is to God. You see, God's desire is for everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. If by what we say and what we do, we push somebody the other direction... It's kind of scary, isn't it? You see, God is love. God loves those people just as much as He loves you. And if we're the ones that cause those people to turn the other direction away from God's mercy, guess who God's going to be upset with? Guess who God's going to protect? We need to be careful not to be a stumbling block. He says, don't let this corrupt communication come out of your mouth. The Bible puts it this way, we need to ponder <laughs> our path before we speak, before we step. I think we would all admit probably we've said things that looking back we shouldn't have said. We've done things that we shouldn't have done. Uh, I've heard this said before, you can't ever get a word back. Hey, I think the Bible says something about that, that this little member in our mouth the Bible says everybody's learned how to tame everything except for this little thing, our tongue. Be careful about what you say and how you say it. Focus on your job. Notice what it says, that it may minister grace. One of these days, we're all going to realize how precious all of these moments were that we had on this earth. We're going to realize how silly the things that we stressed over really were. And we're going to wish that we lived our life a different way. I really believe that. I think every one of us are going to feel that way to a certain extent. Folks, there's one reason, and, and this is not oversimplifying, there's one reason that we're on this earth. This is the, the time of choice, if you want to put it that way. Because God never intended us to live in a world of sin. Would you all say amen to that? God wants us to live eternally with Him. That's home. Amen? So the only reason we're here is to make a choice to be with Him, right? You say, well, I've made that choice. Praise the Lord. Well, good. Then just kick everybody else on your way to heaven, right? No, we have a job. Our job now is to point other people toward God. God. 